can learn. Um, there's some hype in there. So uh, I will do a little bit of explaining about what machine learning is, if you're not familiar with that. Um, hopefully uh, explain what it is and what it isn't. Um, in production, uh, that is slightly a lie. This talk is about a project that was supposed to be in production uh, at this point in time when I committed to doing this several months ago. Um, we've done a lot of the work to, to get it there, uh, but take with a slight grain of salt in that um, I, I won't actually be able to talk about the learnings of, you know, as this thing has scaled up um, so far. Uh, but we will be using scikit-learn. Um, I am a data engineer at Simple. I will tell you a little bit more about um, what Simple is. First, a little bit more background on me. Um, I am Jeff Kalukas. Uh, I came to technology through uh, science. So I went to grad school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I worked on the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, which is really fun. This is me in the cavern of the CMS experiment um, in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, about 100 meters underground. So uh, why do I mention this? Uh, since I now work at a tech company, um, I mention it probably because it's just cool. It was, a fun <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a pretty fun project to work on. Um, I also mention it because uh, when you think of machine learning, you often think of big data. Um, and this was a project that was definitely big data. Uh, like this thing is running, there are collisions happening every 25 nanoseconds, like each one's like a megabyte. It ends up being uh, a huge amount of data. There's like all this cool trigger system to like get down to a manageable size and you still end up with petabytes of data. So like petabytes, you have a thousand gigabytes, is a terabyte, a thousand terabytes is a petabyte. And you have like hundreds of petabytes of data sitting on a disk somewhere, and you're doing distributed stuff to process it. So I got to do that in grad school. Um, never once did they do any machine learning in grad school. So huge data sets, no machine learning. Um, why? Some people do, did use machine learning in that um, realm, but it's kind of something you only resort to if you have to, because in research, like you want you want your results to be interpretable. Um, you want to be able to explain what's going on. So, I, I mean, I'm kind of proud of that, that we really did, I feel like, do a good job of relying on. If you can make a plot and say, I cut out everything below this line on this plot, that is understandable. And, like, those were the kinds of papers that we were writing. So lots of data, but, you know, making these very, like, interpretable things um, on top of it. With machine learning, you're kind of handing data over to a black box. And then you say, like, what did it do in that block box? And you can talk about algorithms, and you can talk about linear algebra, um, but it's a lot. There's a lot more context you need to know. And in the end, um, there are a lot of details that are harder to reproduce. So these are the reasons why you might not want to use machine learning for a problem. Um, and what I'm talking about today is going to be machine learning on a very small data set, which is a couple of gigabytes. Um, this was big data, no machine learning. Today we're talking about machine learning without big data. Um, and there are good reasons uh, to do that or not to do that, and hopefully you'll leave this with a little bit better understanding of why you might want to or not use machine learning for your problem. So a bit of an overview of the story today. Talk more about the problem that we're solving. In our case, it's about classifying text chats. We'll talk about that question of why did we use machine learning for this problem, and why might we not want to use it for this problem. Um, we will walk through uh, steps of developing the model. So you'll get to actually see uh, a bunch of Python code showing you what it looks like to interact with scikit-learn. Um, and it turns out that humans love live demos and seeing things actually happen. Um, so you humans will be able to experience that um, rather than just seeing slides and believing me. Uh, then, we'll, so then we'll talk through some complications of this. Okay, so you've built this kind of toy model. You've proved that it can work and then you actually want to run this thing in production um, and do useful things with it. And what gets complicated about that? How do you manage that whole life cycle of creating a model and using it? Then lastly, we'll talk about if you think that what we did in here is garbage, how else might you decide to, to do this um, if you want to um, do machine learning? And there are lots of different reasons why like the shape of your organization and your team and your problem are likely not going to be exactly what is shown here. Um, so other approaches might work for you. So what is the problem that we're solving? Uh, a little bit of context. This is simple. It's the whole idea of banking remade with lovely design, equally lovely tools to help you save right inside your account, and genuine human goodness. Um, I'm going to actually be focusing on this genuine human goodness part, um, which largely uh, talks about um, 
our customer relations, a big piece of what makes Simple different from some other bank is we have a fantastic customer relations uh, department, which all works at our headquarters in Portland, Oregon. Um, as about half of the, the company is, um, is customer relations. And they're great people. And the problem we're talking about today is about making their lives easier. Um, so I work for Simple. I'm remote, actually. I live in the Columbus area. I'm the only one in Ohio. So <laughs> that was actually important last week. Um, and I'm glad to be back. Um, categorizing chats. Uh, so my customer relations department, the primary, primary way that they end up interacting with customers is through, you know, in the app, you can send a support message or a chat. Uh, and then a customer relations agent uh, gets to respond to that and be pleasant and oftentimes sends you a GIF in the response. Um, uh, that data all makes it into our data warehouse. So what you're seeing right here is um, a fictionalized query uh, somewhat to our, our data warehouse. Amazon Redift is what we use there. So it's a database. You can run a query against it, and you can look at um, a bunch of this chat data. So chats have a subject and a body <clears throat> when you initially submit them. And after you submit a chat, um, there is somebody in customer relations who's assigned to looking at the queue and triaging chats, assigning them categories so that they can go to different people who are specialized in different things. Um, so one of the categories you see here is urgent. If you lose a card, it's something that's exposing you to fraud. It's exposing us to fraud. Um, we want to deal with that as fast as we possibly can. So that's part of the reason of triage is that hopefully we can find these really important things quickly and then make sure that somebody is, is assigned to it. Um, so these are kind of the categories that you might assign. Um, urgent, customer education, a new product, incidents, other, other things. Um, so this is a great situation for machine learning in that we have, we have this data warehouse, we have this data set with um, hundreds of thousands of chat messages uh, that we can go take a look at. Um, and we can have a machine come look at this stuff. And basically what we've got here, subject and body, these are kind of the question. And then category is the answer that we want to get out. So the, the problem that we want to do is we want to do this categorization thing automatically. We want a machine to handle this so that a human doesn't have to. And we already have this large corpus, this large set of, uh, of data where we have a recorded answer. Like a human has already tagged these things, and we can use this as a training data set um, for figuring out if some approach that we have works or does not work. Um, so luckily, we don't have to you know, spin up Mechanical Turk and give our customer information to a bunch of random people uh, that go on Mechanical Turk. Um, just to be a, a little bit more explicit about what this looks like, this is in our web app. Um, this is a case where me, Jeff, actually lost my card in St. Louis. And you know, I sent a message. And this is, this is basically what we're talking about here. So you might have this whole long chat with an agent, but it's just this initial uh, contact where I say, hey, I lost my card. And the subject on, on this was lost card. Um, we want to categorize this thing so we can figure out who to send it to to get the chat started. These are some of the lovely customer relations people that we have. Um, they, they are smart, empathetic people. And we don't want them to have to spend their time sitting and just reading through chats to categorize them. We want them to be using their empathy to actually respond to issues. So how do we approach this problem? Obviously, we want to use machine learning because it's got sparkles and hearts and <laughs> big companies use it. And it makes me feel warm and cuddly and smart. Um, those are bad reasons to use <laughs> machine learning. Um, like I said before, you do sacrifice a lot of interpretability. So uh, if I tell you that I want to use machine learning with this problem, your first question to me might be, couldn't we do something else? And you can imagine you know, things we could do. We could write some simple rules of like, we just have like an if the subject contains the lost card, maybe this is something we want to treat urgently. And you could imagine totally solving this and just like having kind of a list of rules um, that some human is you know, coming up with. Um, and that would be a good, great first pass. Uh, see if that works for you. If that works, then please do that instead of um, doing machine learning. 
there are a couple of reasons uh, why you might want to do this. If you, if you try to do that, but like there's still a whole lot of cases that you aren't catching, um, there are, there's a good chance that machine learning is going to allow you to get farther in terms of optimizing the you know, accuracy and scope of that. It can get very hairy to maintain a rule set like that. Um, in our case, we have a data science department that wants to own that, like figuring out how do we categorize chats. And then we have you know, engineering that is actually you know, taking those rules and putting them into production. And we've had a couple of cases where we've tried to do some simple rules and it ended up being very difficult to like keep that communication going and like do the data scientists just like go in and change the service code. Um, and machine learning, one of the nice things is that you can create a model artifact that then is something that's very easy for engineers to say, you know, then like take that artifact and put it in and it's kind of this thing that data scientists can create something that gets plugged into another service. In our case, um, we get to use a bunch of natural language processing techniques, um, which like this is a, a whole field of research. Um, and it's something that Scikit-Learn, for example, has great support for. So one reason going down this path was nice is that you get to piggyback on a lot of these things that are already existing for the kind of problem that we want to look at. Um, and management wanted us to use machine learning. <laughs> Um, and it, that's something, you know, there is some validity in that, in that like, our data science organization has, uh, has greater ambitions as to like, the ways that they want to do this, and we want to take a small, understandable question to really prove what this whole workflow looks like. Um, so implementing this is hopefully the first step towards having infrastructure to be able to tackle other um, problems with machine learning in the future um, and do exciting new things. So if you are in my shoes and you are an engineer uh, who has never implemented a machine learning uh, problem and you're talking to data scientists and like, we want to do this in Python, we think, and we're using some scikit-learn, um, what would you do? Uh, you would go to the scikit-learn documentation and you would try to figure out what on earth is going on. Uh, so this is, I'm going to kind of walk through my journey of understanding stuff. So Scikit-Learn's documentation, it's actually, it's pretty great. There's some good stuff in there. Um, I recommend you check it out. So if you go to the front page, you go up to the documentation tab, uh, you'll get to the <clears throat> user guide. And it's actually got this really fantastic just first paragraph uh, section about what even is machine learning. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of a highlight here. It says a machine learning problem consists of a set of n samples of data and then tries to, sorry, yeah, it considers a set of n samples of data and then tries to predict properties of unknown data. Okay. If each sample is a singular number and, for instance, a multi-dimensional entry, it is said to have several attributes or features. So in, in our case, we have a data set with two features. There's a body of the message and there's a subject on the message. So we have two features to feed in and then we want to get some answer out of a classification. There are generally two types of machine learning problems. There's supervised learning and there's unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning uh, is in the case where you don't have the answers already. So if you didn't have them already classified, um, this is things like clustering. So you could imagine like taking all of those, those chats and just saying like, hey, algorithm, try to figure out some things that look similar to each other. And maybe that would be useful for even getting a sense of what categories might want, I want to have. And you could like take a look at those clusters. What's in common of those? Oh, it looks like lost card things are you know, a category that I might want to consider. Um, that's not what we're doing. We are doing supervised learning, and in particular, we're doing classification. So we already have a data set where we have you know, some inputs, and what should the classification be? We're going to learn based, you know, we're going to train on that data set, and then we are going to um, spit out a model that's able to take in new inputs and predict a classification for it. Okay, now we get to the fun stuff, the code. Uh, this first slide kind of lays out uh, the whole thing. So be prepared. Uh, we're jumping into scikit-learn. Um, in particular, we are creating a pipeline. So this is, this is one, one of my favorite things about scikit-learn is it has this whole API with lots of bits and pieces, uh, but it provides this nice um, kind of wrapper of you can define a pipeline with a whole bunch of steps of how do I want to process my data? 
and then finally apply a classifier to it. Um, and this ends up making our, our job of um, taking all of this stuff and turning it into an artifact a lot easier um, down the line. So this, this slide serves as an introduction to scikit-learn. It serves as an introduction to natural language processing. Uh, so I'm going to go through uh, each line uh, a little bit here. <clears throat> so creating a pipeline. First step in here, we're giving it a name. We're calling this step preprocess. Um, and then we're passing in this message preprocessor. So message preprocessor processor and text processor, um, in our case, these are, these are two classes that we have defined, but they inherit from this scikit-learn interface of a, um, a transformer mix-in. So it, it gives you this way of, you just instantiate a, a class that's based on this mix-in, and it becomes something that you can throw into a pipeline. So the message preprocessor, um, all of that is doing is it's taking in um, some chunk of data that has a subject and a body in it, and it's turning it into a single string, and it has the subject weight in here. So the subject weight is simply include the subject that many times. So we found that the subject tends to be more important than the stuff that's in the body. So this gives us a way to kind of dial up how important should the subject be. So we just duplicate the subject a bunch of times, append that to the body, and that's the output of this preprocess step. So now we're just down to a string. Then we use this text processor. It takes in stop words and a lemmatizer. So stop words. Um, this is a concept from natural language processing. These are things like and, as, but, just like all of those words that don't really add information, they're just kind of connecting together the sentence. Um, so this is something you might want to play around with. Uh, we might want to include simple, simple.com, other things that are like a, you know, specific to our domain that really aren't adding information to the, uh, to the message. Um, and then a lemmatizer. So this is another natural language processing uh, term. A lemma is the form of a word that you would find in a dictionary. So if you think of stopping, the word that you would look up is stop. So a lemmatizer is just a chunk of code that will take in a bunch of words and change stopping into stop, change going into go, uh, et cetera. Um, so this is, this is some of those like pre-canned techniques that you can take advantage of. Um, you can find lots of documentation on that. So this is cleaning it up. Um, next step is account vectorizer and this term frequency transformer. These these are just progressively going away from, like, we had text at this point, and now we're just kind of creating this mathematical glob uh, that is easier for an algorithm to understand. Um, so I'm not going to go into what those things are specifically. And then finally, uh, now that we have this nice mathematical form of the data, uh, we've turned it into this you know, count of words, and it's transformed. So then we throw it into this classifier. It's a gradient boosted classifier. Don't ask me about the specifics of gradient boosted classifiers. Uh, one of the data scientists just this. Okay, so so this is the so this is the whole pipeline. Um, all the steps that our data is going to go through. Yeah, question. Correct. Yeah. Great question. So one of the great things about Scikit-Learn is that it has become this. Uh, it's kind of a cornerstone of if you want to do machine learning in Python, um, but it doesn't have to stand on its own. And a lot of other packages, um, you know, provide wrappers that make it easy to plug things into Scikit-Learn. So, yes, um, yeah, XGBoost is a separate package, uh, but it provides a nice wrapper, and you can just throw it into a Scikit-Learn pipeline like this. And uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions as we go through. Any other questions at the moment? Uh, it does come with its own classifiers. Yep. Um, how do you define the classifiers? So, yeah, this, I mean, this pipeline object gets, you know, it, like, this is literally a list that we're passing in here to the pipeline object. So it, it holds all this stuff, and then you'll see in the next slide, like, how, it, how we pass data into this whole thing. Yeah, one last question here. Um, Uh, is Natural Language Toolkit a specific library? Yeah. Oh, it, it, NLTK, is that what yeah, it is? Yeah. 
uh, we we I have no idea the overlap there. I think that we are using NLTK in some of the stuff that we are doing here. I can't remember the specifics of whether you know what's built in and what's not. All right. Um, so we have a pipeline. Let's actually do something with it. Um, so the first thing that we have to do is we have to train the model with existing data. Uh, so this gets into a little bit of if you've never heard of pandas. It's part of the Python ecosystem. Uh, just quick introduction to the Python ecosystem. There's NumPy, which is a library that's just like efficient arrays and stuff, kind of like basic building blocks. There's SciPy, which is a bunch of algorithms that are useful. And pandas is kind of like data science glue stuff that makes things convenient. So pandas uh, has this read SQL function. You just pass it in a database connection and a query, and it spits out something that's called the pandas data frame. And it's basically a, you know, it's a big matrix of information with a bunch of convenience functions. So we're pulling all this data out of our data warehouse, uh, the category subject and body. And then we're breaking it up into you know, y is the dependent variable. This is the, the, the thing that we want to figure out, the category. Um, and then x is the, uh, the independent variables, the subject and the body. Um, anything about this line rub you wrong? Anything that seems non-idiomatic about this line? Somebody want to call it out? This is the capital X over here. Why on earth is this a capital X? Um, this should be a lowercase x because it's you know it's a it's a variable in in Python. Um, it's a capital X. This is a case of uh, kind of math idiom trumping Python idiom. So in linear algebra, in math in general, like this is this is a matrix. Yeah, this is this is a single. You know, yeah, this is a one-dimensional thing. This is a multi-dimensional thing. So that's why you'll see these x's be uh, be capitalized. Okay, so we break it up, and then we break it up even more. Uh, what on earth is going on here? Train test split. Um, we are essentially saying we want to reserve one third of the data uh, for testing later, and we're only going to trade this model on two thirds of the data. Why would you want to do that? The more data that you have to train, um, you know, the more accurate your model can potentially be. Um, this. I will explain in a little bit why we want to reserve this. But that's what we're doing. We're reserving one third of the information uh, for testing later. Finally, we call pipeline.fit, and we pass in all of this uh, information, this training data set um, in there. So we're telling it that you know, the x stuff, those independent variables, and we're also telling it these are the answers that we've already um, created. So once you've done that, <clears throat> You want to go back and you want to use this test data to validate how is it performing and why do you need to validate? It's because there's something called overfitting. Um, so imagine that these black points are some sort of data that you're interested in. You could fit that with this black line here, a nice you know straight line. You notice that doesn't pass through the points, so there's some like error there. It's not perfectly modeling the data. But you know, generally, the black dots tend to be in the lower left corner, and they tend to be in the upper right corner. This black line is, is telling you something about the underlying structure. This blue line perfectly fits the data. It hits every point. But if I take some more observations, do you think that they are going to fall perfectly on that blue line? Probably not. This blue line tells you absolutely nothing about the underlying structure of the data. So this, this is overfitting. This blue line is like you have extracted too much out of your uh, training data set. And like, it's, just, it's just gibberish. It doesn't really tell you anything about predicting future, future results. So that's why you want to reserve some so you can tell, have I overfit? Um, will this be able to make reasonable predictions for, for future inputs? So testing the model uh, looks like this. We have our x test. Uh, matrix here, uh, we're throwing it into this predict method of the pipeline. So that spits out you know, what, what the model says the answer should be for this test data. And then we're printing out this classification report that considers you know, the, what the model predicted, and then what were the actual 
you know, assignments that the humans made to this. It does some statistic-y things, um, and then it spits out, this is generally you know, how you are performing. We aren't going to go into the statistics of this, and this is actually, this is bogus, and does not actually reflect the data that was um, thrown in there. Um, but that's the kind of thing that you can get out. Um, the score is, is kind of basically telling you, if this were a one, it means like, you always got it, your model's doing great. Um, if this is lower, it's giving you a sense of um, kind of what, what maximum performance you can expect for future inputs. So we've actually uh, trained the model. We've put some information through uh, the pipeline. So we, we have a model that we can use. And now in order to put that into some context where it can be used in the future, uh, we want to actually wrap that in a Flask service. Um, so this is what it looks like to uh, actually be able to spit out uh, classifications in an API using Flask. So we um, are defining a, a route. Um, so we're going to have a service that you can hit a URL that looks like this. Um, this is a messages endpoint. Um, you post JSON data here. Uh, you pull your know, messages out of that JSON. Then we're calling this pipeline.predict method again. This is the same thing that we called in testing. And then we're just massaging the data out of those predictions and JSONifying it again for something that we can spit back to the user um, that requested. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Uh, asking about uh, pickling and persisting model. Um, OK, so live demo time. Uh, this is exciting because uh, it means that I can mess up all sorts of things. So um, over on the right here, we're going to actually start up this Flask app. Um, I, it's bundled up in this bin run executable that we created. So it's now running. We have a Flask app going. And you'll see this spit out log messages as we make uh, requests. So let's try to hit this API. We get 405, just because we said that this should be a post. So we just made a get request. Uh, it returned a 405 because we didn't tell it what to do with the get request. So let's make this a post instead. So dash x post. I'm using curl, which is the command line uh, thing for making HTTP requests. Got 400 this time, getting a little bit better. We're making a post request now, but we aren't actually posting any data. So we need to actually give it what data are we trying to post. Uh, so let's actually put in um, a whole message here. So, <laughs> so uh, you can just ignore these two IDs. This is just for like re tracking so that you know, when you're making a request, you can understand what is the message that I'm getting back. Um, but we're putting in a body and a subject here. And this thing is actually running. And we're going to see what classification it makes for this message. Do you like that class label? It correctly classified as urgent. Good job. So um, let, let's make another request here. Let's say um, instead of this, I am interested in uh, some new feature. So let's say uh, joint accounts. Uh, I want to ask about joint accounts. And I'm going to put in my body here. I want to share money with my bay. <laughs> All right, that ended up being customer education. I think that I, uh, yeah. If you do a slightly different thing, I want to share, let me see, so share an account. Yeah, OK. I, I got this to say new product earlier. So you can tell here, this is not perfect. <laughs> Uh, there was not like material difference between those two, um, so it it identified. So the shared accounts were like a big new thing that we launched in January. We didn't have joint accounts for a long time, so people were very excited about this. Uh, but that was a new product. Um, all right, anybody want to volunteer information for one last request, and we'll see what it does. I'm curious if you on your first one, yeah. if you change lost to found, what it does. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, let's see. I found my card. Uh, uh, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah I can just build the last card thing up there. Uh, I found. Yeah, it might still. The ASAP part may mark this as urgent. So interesting. They they may. I don't remember whether we. I don't remember whether we strip out punctuation. Uh, we may strip out punctuation. But I'm I'm looking for a volunteer to put something else into this before we move on. Okay, what kind of card protection? Uh, I'll say protection. Protection. Ooh, what kind do you offer? What kind do you offer? Kind people. <laughs> yeah, customer education. Um, a, a lot of these end up getting labeled customer education, which I think shows that we have a lot of things that we tag customer education um, in our input. So I, I am running lower on time, so I'm going to keep on chugging, and I'm going to go back to the slides. Um, so great, we have a toy. Okay, all right, all right. Um, so we have a nice toy. Uh, it doesn't work perfectly. But uh, it, it does, it's better than not having any classification at all at this point. Um, so we, we put it in a web app kind of shape. Uh, how do we actually take this to production and allow our data scientists to do their thing and create models and allow this to actually get into this application? Um, this was supposed to be, oh, oh yeah, okay. I, I, was, I was supposed to say something about the training wheels coming off. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so some things that you might want to um, consider. I'm going to talk about like three steps of stuff uh, that we did to, to turn this into something more sustainable. Uh, so the first step of real life here is separating training, training the model, and actually serving the model. But again, this is kind of like data scientists want to control training the model. Engineers care about serving the model. The one is kind of a batch-oriented thing. The other thing is something we want to serve in real time um, in a service. So to do that, we need to persist the model somewhere and have it you know, someplace where the service can then pick it up. Um, and somebody asked the question of, did you use Pickle to do this? Unfortunately, yes. Yes, we did. Uh, and why did we do that? Because if you look in the documentation uh, for Scikit-learn, like it has a section about model persistence. And it says, hey, well, there's built-in support for Pickle. It has some issues. If you don't want to use Pickle, you're on your own. Um, and that is pretty much, th this is one of the hairiest things, actually. Um, and this is something that, uh, you know, I, I'll talk a little bit later about what some like larger uh, companies do to solve this problem. Um, but we are using Pickle. Um, issues with Pickle, if you aren't familiar with, so Pickle is a, a, like a built-in uh, Python library for taking a Python object and serializing it into something you can put in a file. Uh, issues with it are, number one, it's like, it's code. Um, and if you unpickle something, it, really, it gets a chance to just run arbitrary code. So you definitely don't, if, if your friend says, hey, I found this file, you want to unpickle it? Say no. <laughs> don't do it. Uh, so you want to trust where you get your pickle from before you unpickle it. <laughs> this is, this is in life. <laughs> Whew. Well, this got exciting. Um, in our, so in our case, uh, we're using Pickle, um, and the place that we're doing this, like we're all in Amazon Web Services, so S3 is the object store in uh, AWS. So we're creating an S3 client. KMS is Amazon's uh, key management service. Um, so what we're doing here is we're dumping our pipeline object to a Pickle file. We're then encrypting that Pickle file, um, and we're putting that object to S3. Why are we encrypting it? Um, again, we're using this key management thing. It's, this is to guarantee that it came from this service that has access to the key. Or like, whoever created this pickle had access to the key, uh, and hopefully it wasn't some rogue engineer that has access to many things. Hopefully it was actually the service. Um, yep. So that's what it looks like for us to uh, turn this thing into a pickle and put it in S3, uh, and then our flask gap um, pulls the thing up when when we start the app, that's what we've decided. Uh, so we have no way of like automatically doing that. Uh, if we want to change which thing, which model we're using, 
we just we change the, the config file and we restart the service in order to pull in um, that new updated model with more training data or with updated logic. Um, and one, that's one of the really nice things about the scikit-learn pipeline is it's, uh, yeah, it's packaging together um, all the logic of the pipeline along with um, the kind of the trained, the trained data. So you pull this out, you unencrypt it, um, and then you have it available to your, to your app to use. Um, step two is provide an environment for doing this batch training and evaluation. I'm going to read through this quickly. Um, this is something like the actual training of the model. Uh, data scientists could do that on their laptop. Um, in our case, it's not super computationally expensive. Um, so you could just do that, create the thing, uh, you know, the create your model there, and then have the data scientist put in S3. Uh, we want some more guardrails on that, because like, what if they pulled in some random version of something or whatever? Uh, so when we train the model, we want to know like what version of the code is used, what are all the libraries, um, really be able to uh, reproduce this model uh, if it came to it. Um, you also might want to do really computational, uh, computationally expensive things when you're training um, the model. So something that we could do is there's this grid search thing um, what this whole blob is, is just saying like, hey, our pipeline had all these parameters we were passing in. We don't know if those are the best parameters. Let's try out a whole bunch of different options in a bunch of different combinations. And like five times three times three times two times two times two is already 360 different combinations. Let's just run this whole process to fit the model on each one of those combinations. Uh, and that's where you start being like, well, that's, it would be nice to have an environment to just do all of that stuff and not do it on my laptop. Um, so that's something that you may want to consider. And step three is when you actually, you know, you have your app running, you know, how do you know if it's doing reasonable things? So you want to do kind of all the things that you would do with any other um, web service. You want to monitor the performance. Uh, you have to figure out how you adapt to production load if there are, you know, are there spikes. And when this happens, do we get pretty average consistent from the model? Um, Pretty, pretty average performance from the model, or does that vary a lot? Um, how do you degrade gracefully if something goes terribly wrong? And you know, other applications that are now you're relying on getting these uh, predictions back don't get predictions back. Um, and as I said at the beginning, um, we really, I don't have a whole lot to say on this subject yet because we have not actually started relying on this yet. Um, so we have, we have a toy, we know that the general approach works, um, but we, we shall see how it goes when we actually get this into, um, into production and rely on it. So last thing I want to uh, touch on is what are some other approaches if you don't want to uh, you know, put together your own batch uh, process, figure out how you're going to do all the persistence uh, and all of that. Um, so considerations is how big is your team? For us, uh, we have a team of three data, data engineers right now. We have a team of like uh, half a dozen data scientists, but like all of us were kind of working on this part, part time and it took us kind of three months to build what we built. Uh, a lot of companies that really care about machine learning have a whole like team of machine learning engineers um, and stuff. And this starts to look very different in that case. If you're really big and you have lots of engineering resources to throw at it and you care a whole lot about the performance of the model, um, what a lot of people will do is sometimes actually train the model in scikit-learn or you know, in Python, data scientists are familiar with that. They can create this, you know, some artifact. But you choose some custom serialization format, like you dump it out to some JSON with the parameters, and then you might have an application written in Java or Scala or something else to actually run the model and get better performance that way. And you've kind of defined your own interface to get from one language to the other, and that takes a whole lot more effort than what we threw at this. Um, so how large of a problem space do you need to cover? If you do that sort of thing that I just said of like defining your own custom serialization format between one and the other, uh, you, you have to do that for every different kind of model that you want. So this is something where like right now, we don't know what all kinds of models we might, might want to use. So we wanted to focus on, let's try to do something that we could adapt to like other stuff in scikit-learn. Um, and you know, we might want to you know, spin off some completely different model. So it's kind of nice that right now, we could do something that is significantly different from this natural language processing uh, problem and throw it in there. Uh, so 
those are some of the considerations you might think about. There are also companies that would love to take your money. Um, I don't know how legit any of these are. Uh, these are some of the ones that I found. Y, y Hat has a science ops platform. There's Anaconda Enterprise. There's Domino. They all have these nice shiny marketing materials and they claim that they're gonna like solve your communication issues and everybody's gonna be able to live in their happy land. And um, you know, it, there's some variation of like, we'll provide infrastructure for you to like run this stuff. Your data scientists can like click on buttons and decide what version of a model is being promoted. Um, so it, it, it solves a bunch of those problems. Um, we didn't go too far down the path of understanding that. All right, I am going to finish up here. Um, you want to train test in batch environments, even if you want to serve your results in, in real time. Um, you have this nice concept of like serializing something and having this artifact of your trained model that you can then use in a different context. And scikit-learn's pipeline module is really helpful for making that happen. Um, and then actually serving the model in a real-time context. Once you figure the rest of this out, this looks a whole lot like just serving any other application and likely the details of your own environment um, apply to that. So thank you. Um, and we have approximately eight minutes for questions. Um, I am on Twitter, at Jeff Lucas. I have already posted these slides. Uh, so you can see them on Twitter. Um, I will try to remember to post them in Slack or if somebody would like to go ahead and post that link in Slack, that would be good. So what questions do you have? That question here. Once it is in production, do you have any way of seeing from the results, uh, of learning from the results of the uh, thing so that it's say 95% of uh, the uh, queries are classified as customer education. Uh, you uh, can think you might be able to detect that there might be an issue with your training materials and so forth. Yeah, our, our plan is to, um, you know, first of all, we're going to be uh, like logging all these results to a database. OK, yeah, I will repeat the question. So the question was, um, how will we know, basically, like as, as we're using this in production and we get answers out of it, how are we going to know like how well we're doing and you know, if it's way over classifying things to one thing, how are we gonna react to that? Um, and we are planning to persist all of these classifications that happen um, to a database. Uh, so it'll be kind of a flexible data set that we can look at. Also, we're expecting if we classify things wrong, you know, humans will still end up reclassifying them. So that'll be a very interesting thing to look at is you know, how many of these things get reclassified um, and then, you know, it's to be seen like how much of that we feed back into the model and what exactly parameters we use to filter out uh, what we train into new versions of the model. So yeah. as you're uh, prototyping here, running it, um, does it take a lot of resources at, at that stage? So it does, um, does this take a lot of resources while you're prototyping it? Uh, that probably depends on what you're doing, but in, in our case, it's like it's the query to the database that's the expensive thing. So like I pull that in, um, and then I can pretty quickly iterate, like training the model in this case, it, it's like it takes a second or two. Um, but again, that very much depends on what algorithm you're using. There are all sorts of expensive uh, classifiers and you know, other processing that you can do on data. So uh, you mentioned that uh, you know, the engineers need to end up serving it up. Have you found good efficiencies or good optimizations? Because you, you just saw on this class gap. Mm -hmm. More likely, different engineering groups are going to have their own different shipping curve stuff. Yep. Have you found good optimization, optimizations for that as far as that's possible? I, yeah, so the question is, uh, yeah, what optimizations uh, have we found? Um, like we're running a flask app, you know, how does that perform? And we don't know at this point. We, we expect it to be like, it's a pretty low volume um, data set at this point. Uh, so we're not expecting to see performance issues. Um, but it will be very interesting to see uh, you know, how we're able to handle it. Way, but, uh, we tried putting the statistical model in the repo of the API uh, for like GitHub, so if you're using like Docker or Kubernetes or something, and you're spinning up that image on every uh, pull request to master, you have your statistical file in the repo, 
Yeah, there's, there's not much we've learned yet in, in that area. Yeah. How many messages were in our training set? I should have an answer for that. It's something on the order of like 100,000, I think. Um, or here. Uh, if your data science is pretty easy, there's some tool like R or something. Would that approach be uh, something you could modify to accommodate that? Um, so, yeah, if our data scientists were using something like R, uh, would we be able to modify this approach? Um, we, we kind of decided to go all in on Python of like we most of our web services we create are in Scala. Uh, spinning up a Flask app in Python is weird for us, so that's somewhat uncharted territory. But we decided like that's worth doing because it unlocks the whole Python data ecosystem, and we can just train the model in Python and then serve it in Python, and that gives us a lot of flexibility for right now. So the short answer is like uh, we would also have to figure out how to serve an R model if we wanted to do that, and so. That is not something we're planning to do. Yep. So okay, uh, did we have trouble building a batch uh, training um, environment uh, that we could actually get buy-in from? So we we already happened to have a. Uh, basically a scheduled task service running that happens to be in Python. Uh, it's using Celery um, to like basically be a really dumb and expensive cron uh, solution. So we've, that was, that was something that was already existing. We're like, this is Python, we can throw Python code in here. So that, that's what we're using and it was convenient for our particular situation. Um, and our data scientists were already used to creating jobs in there. So yeah, the question is uh, when yeah when we have you know humans going in and reclassifying things, um, does that get into the realm of reinforcement learning if we're throwing that back into the model? I am not super familiar with the term reinforcement learn. Uh, yeah, reinforcement learning. Yeah, so. I am not going to make a comment on that because I don't want to spread misinformation. Um, but likely, likely yes. So if you have hard coding models, you probably do things like uh, you could use like a uh, big help and classify that as urgent or you know, like mm -hmm. some obvious rules. Have you seen any examples of where you know you, you want to use machine learning to go past those obvious rules and find exceptions, like if someone says, please help me learn about this new product. Have you seen any examples of when it you know manages to um, yeah. So, so, yeah. So the question is about um, have you have you seen examples of where, like, you have kind of like a concept of please help, and is it able to find variants of that that you weren't, you know, that a human wasn't uh, anticipating? Um, I, I don't. Uh, yeah, not off the top of my head, but I mean, if if you play around with this, like, yes, I mean that idea of like stemming words, like lemmatizing, um, all that, like it, it works. It works pretty well. Um, so, it, yeah, it, it's something worth playing around with. Um, all right, I, I will take one more question. Yep. I, I know you mentioned this in the beginning of the talk, so I apologize if you're if you're to reiterate. Yep. Well, what is the, the goal, I guess, of all this? So you already have human beings classifying the information. Yep. What are you hoping to get out of having a machine? Yeah, so, so we already have a process for humans classifying these chats. What's the benefit of having a machine do this? Um, so it's, it's two things. Um, you know, first of all, it's getting that workload off of a human, so it's um, a human that can go do something else. Um, I'm sorry, the workload, yeah. though, is yeah. just like picking from the top down button, right? Yeah, so yeah, the workload is, yeah, I mean, the, the workload is reading through the message, understanding what it is, you know, picking, yeah, picking some category from a drop down um, and going through that. So yeah, so it, it removes a human having to be dedicated to that task and being able to do what they are more, uh, you know, talented at doing. 
um, also reduces the amount of time to get to that classification. So even if you have like a triage system set up, maybe somebody's like going in once an hour and you know, working down you know, the list of new messages. Um, and with this, it's, you know, as soon as a message comes in, uh, within seconds, it can have that first dev of classification. So then your people that are assigned to working urgent tickets, like those are immediately available in that queue. Um, for the, so we are, we're hoping that it's gonna bring down the mean time to resolution on those urgent issues. Thank you, everybody. I'm happy to answer.